Representative Chris Capping of Delafield represents the 99th Assembly District, um, but he is in a three-way Republican primary on June 23rd for the 33rd Senate District. Chris, welcome back to Wisconsin. Thank Hi. you. Glad to be here. Glad to be doing this candidate interview. Yeah. So on my way in, I'm driving and I'm listening to a Milwaukee radio station and I hear the ad, the 33rd Senate District needs a CPA. Hey, and let's I like start it. there. <laughs> Why does the 33rd need a CPA? Yeah. Well, I, I always tell people, hey, you know what, look at, look at my history. History is the best predictor of the future. Look at, look at what what I've accomplished with my colleagues in the state assembly over the last four years, and we've we've moved the state significantly in the right direction. And uh, so I ask voters to check it out and look at you know we've talked a lot before in some previous interviews about the CPA caucus and yes. and just the different perspective that we have coming into the legislature. You know we were the first set of CPAs. Howard Markline is the first CPA in the state senate in history. I mean, that's amazing when you're talking about $74 billion in taxpayer money. But also, it's, it's a unique perspective on the other side of it. With, you know, we all, people say you look at money a mm -hmm. lot, you're so focused on fiscal issues. But the fiscal issues, we always look at the return on investment. You know, this program is created for this purpose. Let's make sure it's, it's hitting that purpose. So I, I think that perspective is very useful. And has proven useful in the uh, in the legislature. Well, um, one of the one of the things in the same ad, yeah, the CPA caucus of which you remember found mm -hmm. a one billion slush fund mm -hmm. in the UW system. So let me ask this: the governor said, "Let's cut um, let's cut that state aid mm -hmm. three hundred million over two years." And now Joan Finance is at two fifty over two right. years. Yep. Do you think the governor's original recommendation was justified in light of the? Sure. Slush fund? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you look at the overall dollar amount, it, the um, the amount of the the reduction in their budget was, you know, roughly three percent. And anybody, you know, families over the last five years have learned that adjustments in your budget can be done. I think if you look at historically, how much has the budget increased? I think a three percent decrease in the budget is something that. Um, it, it, it's a good exercise to go through every once in a while, and I don't think it's too much to ask in this situation, especially from families. You know, look at, again, both sides of this. There are families out there who are struggling to make the tuition payments. My neighbor, for, for instance, is one of them. They have a student in UW system. He came to my door after the, the freeze in tuition. He said, Chris, I know we don't know each other very well, but thank you. Thank you for doing that. That really helps us as a family um, make the tuition payments. Um, when the joint finance budget gets to the full assembly floor, mm -hmm. are you going to accept a two, $250 million cut over two, or are you going to try to take it back to 300 sir? Well, w what we have to do is I'm not in joint finance, so I don't vote on individual pieces of the budget. Yes. I am going to have to step back and look at what joint finance comes to the floor with and says, here's the bill as a whole. So there are a lot of things in there, like UW funding, the arena, which is a hot topic right now, prevailing wage, which we're pushing for. I have to step back as a legislator, not on joint finance, and say, Say, is this budget as a whole good for the state of Wisconsin? Right now, I have I have some pretty serious concerns about the budget, as proposed. We still have to see the, mm -hmm. you know, joint finance has to finalize that yet. So, I'm waiting to see what the final package is going to look like. In February, the governor suggested that the UW system be able to operate separate from um, the mm -hmm. legislative branch. Uh, operate with uh, autonomy. Mm -hmm. Is that something you're glad is no longer a part of the joint finance budget, sir? You know what, I didn't really have a strong opinion either way on that. I've talked to people in the UW system who said, yes, this is great, and then I talked to people who said, you know, what is this really going to do for us? And uh, I think that's something that maybe down the road we can have more discussions on it, but whatever the proposal is, uh, again, I have to look at the package that's there. I think more autonomy is good if there's still accountability in place because it is still significant taxpayer dollars that are being spent there. Um, John Nigren used a curious term on the issue of transportation funding. He said we're in a stare down now with the <laughs> governor. The governor in February recommended 1.3 billion with a B in mm -hmm. bonding. Too much? Uh, are you one of those that says too much? Absolutely. If, if so, um, are you willing to support uh, gas tax, which the governor has taken off the table, or raising the registration fee that you and mm -hmm. I pay to register our vehicles? Absolutely not. I think that before we can talk about revenue adders, the solution is right in front of us. That is prevailing wage. We have to deal with this issue. 
Once we deal with the issue of prevailing wage, then we can reassess where things are at and, and determine, hey, do we still need a revenue adder? Or the other option that really hasn't been discussed yet is this reprioritization of projects. My first budget, when I came in, I remember very specifically them saying, this is a little bit unusual because we have some catch up. So this budget will not always be this big. It's temporary. Mm -hmm. The second budget came in, same exact thing said, this is, this is temporary, and now we're into the third budget cycle of significant transportation dollars and significant bonding, as you know, right. and it's becoming a permanent thing, and that is not right. We have to control our spending. Once we have looked at that, and I'm comfortable that we are prioritizing projects properly, and we've got prevailing wage pulled out, then we can say, is there a significant shortfall? Because obviously, transportation and roads for commerce to education is critically important. Um, well, I was surprised last week when uh, Speaker Voss said we may pass a no bonding budget and the governor said if you do that I'll sign it. Is that realistic? What's the most uh, bonding authority that you would agree to in the next two years, Representative? Well, overall I think what I want to do is I want to see the trajectory of our overall debt go down. So th the problem is you can say we're only doing $1.3 in bonding, but if we're refinancing bonds, for instance, the last two budgets, we've refinanced bonds. Yes. So overall, Which pushes out the debt you service got it, period. exactly. So our debt service costs continue to rise, and especially from a transportation standpoint, we're getting to the point where those debt service costs are eating up a significant portion of the budget. So what we need to do is, is my goal is to say, we need to start getting our debt load overall to be going down because we cannot sustain, we're over, I think it's going to be over 15 billion in debt total. The statutory limit last time we looked at it was probably 22, 23 billion. Um, that is, we, we have to control that. And I, I think we just have to make sure we're, we're looking at where the dollars are spent. A big issue that we have to deal with, and, and the governor, to his credit, is implementing a, a new budgeting software right now. So PeopleSoft is being implemented, and I'm kind of the legislative guy on that team. So in order to know or control your dollars, you know, whether it's your family or a business, you have to understand where they're going. The state is putting in place a, a good software package, budgeting process, that will help us determine where those dollars are going. Once we can do that, and we can say, this is a bad program, here's why. Mm -hmm. We can reallocate those dollars to something that's more impactful for, for that purpose. Or we can say, you know what, here's a section of programs that just do not need to be there because they're not doing anything, and that may take care of our bonding issue. Okay, now, now let's talk about the Bucks deal. Let's go back to yeah. February. The governor recommended state support of 220 from the yep. so-called jock tax. That's morphed. Now, the governor's press conference last week said, State support of bonding of $55 million, mm -hmm. that's a long way down from 220 mm -hmm. When you pay that off, it costs 80 um, Are you closer to being able to support the Bucks deal that was announced last week, sir? No, absolutely not. And, and again, it goes back to if we put prevailing wage in place, the bill, the full repeal bill that we've looked at, right. we wouldn't even have to be having this discussion. Put prevailing wage in place, let's reassess the dollars. The other thing is in Milwaukee, I've got a contractor, for instance, in my district who does roofing. And he said, Chris, I do a contract here in Waukesha County, and then I go to Milwaukee County and do a contract. It's literally twice as expensive because of all the red tape, regulation, residency requirements. We have to look at that if we're even going to consider state dollars or taxpayer dollars in any way. We have to look at those regulations and say, you know what? That's not right because the taxpayers are paying for that. Once we've addressed that, then we can go to, okay, if there's a shortfall and the bucks are going to leave, what kind of public funding? I think it needs to be a local referendum. I don't think you can use general tax dollars from around the state because there is not support around the state. I think if you pull this bill or pull the arena out and put it in a separate bill, mm -hmm. I don't think it would pass right now. Okay. Um, well, then next steps. Uh, well, here's my question. If prevailing rage repeal is part of the budget, mm -hmm. would you reconsider your opposition to the Bucks deal, or do they travel completely separately in your mind? It depends on what it is, but I think if we, I, I would consider, prevailing wage to me is kind of the big, it, it's the big thing right now because that is long-term sustained savings for the taxpayer. So if, if the governor and the speaker came in and said, we're going to do a full repeal, but we're still going to put $55 million into the budget or $50 million plus whatever the interest in the long term, we're talking $80 million. Right. If that was in place, I can 
comfortably go back to my constituents and say, guys, we're gonna we're gonna save between 300 to 400 million dollars a year because this part is in the budget. Overall, the budget is good for the taxpayer. That's a situation I could start getting my arms around. If prevailing wage is not in the budget that's on the assembly floor, are 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 you a no? I never draw a hard line on a single issue. I think that's I think that's dangerous for a legislator to do because I don't know what else is going to be in there. There could be something very impactful for the state that I don't know about yet that would be, again, beneficial overall. So I have to look at that final budget proposal, see what's in there, and then make that decision. Senator Strobel, as you're aware, said um, for me to vote for the budget, the compromise on pre prevailing wages, mm -hmm. uh, abolish it for local uh, local government contracts. Is that, mm -hmm. would, would that be an acceptable compromise that doesn't get to the full repeal? I think it's a very good compromise. I mean, that would be a good thing to go to because the mun municipalities are constantly coming to us saying, hey, you know, thank you for not passing down the, the mandated things, you know, we have to pay for out of our unfunded mandates. Um, but we still have a tool here that you guys could really help us with. So municipalities are, are, would love it, school districts would love it, but is that the best thing? No. But I'm not going to let perfection be the enemy of good by saying if it's not absolute full repeal, then I'm not going to touch it. I, I don't think that's a good stance to take. Representative De Dean Knudsen last week said, I don't think we should have cr created WEDIC, Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Is it time to get rid of WEDIC? Or does it fulfill a valuable purpose? Yeah. As a free market guy, I, I really struggle with the proposal of having government come in and, and try to, you know, if you look at their specific industry segments that they've said, hey, these are really important to us. I think that is a dangerous and slippery slope. I was at a, a mid-market acquisition uh, forum about three weeks ago, and it was global company CEOs. They had four of them up front, and every single one of those CEOs said, you know what, guys, that's great. You have these tax incentives, and you have things to try and help us. We would have come here anyway because it's your workforce. That's why we are here. You guys have a very good workforce. You can't find this elsewhere. So that's nice you have these tax incentives and these loan programs. Those just were freebies for us. I think that's very telling when the business community is saying that. We need to relook at where our dollars are focused. CPAs like you read audits, so you've probably read the Weedic audits. Um, has it... Has Weedick wasted millions of dollars of, of public funds, sir? I think there's definitely been some misallocation of funds and misuse of funds. Um, we were, when, when the CPA caucus came in, we really looked at that, and I requested an aging report, which in your business, if you have people who owe you money, you want to make sure they're keeping their payments. And w when we saw the aging report, they realized there were companies on there who had not made payments in years. And that is not good uh, stewardship of the taxpayer money. So there definitely were some problems. I know the governor has stepped in. They've taken actions to, to improve it, and I think it's taken some big steps. I don't think you can take something that's somewhat broken and fix it 100% immediately. That takes some time. I think there's good progress, but uh, there definitely is, is some, some room for improvement. Well, Joint Finance has said, okay, this $55 million should no longer go to businesses, but let's put it out there to develop a better system of incentives. Mm -hmm. Are you fine with that? Uh, no, I would prefer that, for, to prefer us to look more again at the worker training because every single CEO that was up at that forum that I just spoke about yeah. said, we can't find enough workers. If you guys could help facilitate connecting workers with our companies, that would bring a ton of value to us. And, and again, we have to look at what businesses are asking for. And, and the problem with government sometimes is we're so in, we can be so inward focused in creating our own great ideas. But if we don't take the input from the outside, we may not be doing the best use with taxpayer dollars. So I would prefer we relook at our training programs and analyze or, or even just work programs and say, we have got to somehow connect the workers with the, with the, with the, the employers. I saw your interview on a Milwaukee television station. T uh, talk to me about your two strikes and your out plan mm -hmm. for unemployment uh, benefits, sir. Yeah, so what we had was we found out that th there's, there's unemployment insurance fraud that takes place. So you know, people who get fired for some reason, they actually, they were going in and still collecting even if they weren't eligible to collect, whether it's, you know, we found some people in prison, we found people that had another job and we never caught it. 
from the employer side, we are putting we we've put sanctions in place, but we didn't have anything that really had teeth from the person who I mean everyone knows they're working and collecting an un unemployment insurance check. Mm -hmm. They know that's not right, but we really didn't have sanctions in place to penalize those people as, as hard as we should have, I think. So what we're doing finally is trying to make sure that we've got something with teeth, we say, that will prohibit or try to have people not commit that fraud because there's no, they know, hey, if I get caught twice, I'm out. I don't, I, seven years, I don't get anything. Um, from your website, just two more issues. Mm -hmm. um, the Senate's going to debate a bill that would prohibit abortions if the uh, unborn is more than 20 weeks mm -hmm. old. That's a bill that you look forward to voting to when it gets to the Assembly? Yeah, I actually voted for it in committee. Okay. Yeah, so Assembly had That's committee right. hearing. Yes. I voted for that bill. I think it's a great bill. It okay. moves the ball forward in protecting life, which I am 100% for. And then uh, kind of another CPA issue. The, the governor recommended th that there be no more land purchases on the yes. under stewardship. Yep. For 13 years, because of the high cost of debt service, Joint Finance has voted to con to continue the stewardship per uh, purchases. Uh, your feelings on yeah. that? Yeah. So here's my proposal that I put out to both sides because I have a lot of constituents who who reached out to me on this, and I said, at some point we have to say the state owns or covers enough pro uh, enough acres. We've got uh, a significant amount of land owned by the state. But I understand their concern with, hey, there may be some high priority projects here that we really want to protect and we need to get those in the fold. So my proposal was this, let's make a compromise. Let's allow, let, let's cap and say we are done. We can't spend any more money. But if somebody finds a high priority project, we have to sell off some inventory, some low priority inventory, which will force the stewardship fund to prioritize inventory and sell off low priority inventory to pay for the new inventory. And both sides looked at that and they said, you know what, that actually makes sense. You're going to offer that as a floor amendment I've already to the budget? Uh, no, I will not offer a floor amendment. I offered a, um, a budget proposal on that and they oh. did not take it up. Okay, two, two more questions. Of all the changes that um, have occurred, and you, you are in your third term, mm -hmm. it's been a pretty historical four years. Yeah. Which do you consider the most important, sir? Right to work. Right to work? 100%. That was, that was on my initial lit piece. That was, I don't know if you remember during the debates, but, but that was very personal to me because when I was 19, I actually was forced into a union, and I could not believe in the United States of America that me and an employer had to have a third party engaged that I did not want part of and he really didn't have a choice in having part of. To me, that was a huge piece of legislation that, We've been trying since 1947 to get passed in this state. It will significantly improve the business environment. I got a call the day after we passed that bill, which, which I authored in the assembly, from a company who has a conglomeration of companies. And they said, Chris, just so you know, because you passed that bill, we're taking a company out of Minnesota and we're moving it to Wisconsin just because you're right to work. That is, we're seeing story after story about that. It's helping. Companies who are here are not going to leave because of right to work, but you're attracting new industry, and people will stay here if they're going to expand. It's very exciting. Finally, do you want to offer uh, any differences between you and your two uh, opponents in the June 23rd primary, Chris? I, I just say this. There's two things very clearly different. Number one, the experience. I'm the only person who's got legislative experience, and I will say I think you, you, there's some strong experience there that, that voters can look at to say, you know what, I know what Chris is going to do in the Senate if we put him there. It's very clear. The other candidates can only say, well, this is what I will do. It's a difference between action and words. The second thing is I'm the only business owner and CPA in this, in this race. I think those skill sets are very useful in the, uh, in the legislature right now, and I'd love to be able to use those for the voters in the Senate like I have in the Assembly. Thank you. Representative Chris Kappinga of Delafield represents the 99th Assembly District. He's one of three candidates in the Republican primary on June 23rd in the 33rd Senate District. Chris, thanks for talking to Thank Wisconsin you. Thank you.